Hello, welcome to Pro Tips 47, where since it's Cybersecurity Month, I'm going to take a look at our Risk Insights module, not just the obvious things that you might already be aware of, but I'm also going to try and show you a few things that are a bit more hidden, some functionality that's a bit more hidden, um, and the things that are very useful about it so you can make as best as use as possible out of it um, and use it in your environment as well. So without further ado, let's head into Land Super. I'm gonna show you a few things about our Risk Insights. So starting on our default site, I'm gonna head over obviously to the Risk Insight area where you'll also be able to see all of the vulnerabilities that are in your environment that we've been able to identify in your environment. Um, now, obviously this is a very long list, um, but there's a few things here that you might not be aware of. Um, the first thing, obviously most important, is being able to find the vulnerability that you're looking for. Um, you can either search for vulnerabilities by just you know, typing in a CV code in the search box, or there's also another way um, that I found if you happen to come across a vulnerability uh, on a news website or in one of your RSS feeds or however you track vulnerabilities or stay up to date, with vulnerabilities, um, you might come across a CV code that you know is very widespread or is being talked about a lot, and you just want to check whether you have any devices vulnerable or not. Obviously, you can simply add it here in the search box, and that should work. Um, but if I just take a random one that I already had pasted in and I search for it, it says it's empty. Now you could assume or you will assume that it's not been found in your environment, so you're kind of safe. Um, but what if you do want more information about this? Um, you've just seen some headlines about it, but you don't really know much about it. There is another way, um, and for that I'm gonna have to go out of full screen. Um, looking at our URL that we have, um, if we just go to any random vulnerability, I'm just clicking the first one that's at the top, you'll see that in the URL there's actually the CV code as well. Um, and you can just replace that with any CVE code that you found, so I'm gonna remove all the rest paste in that CV code that I already had copied, hit enter, and that will bring you to the vulnerability or the vulnerability page that we have for that specific vulnerability. Again, this information has been pulled from uh, both the NIST vulnerability database and the Microsoft Security and Response Center. Um, so you'll have all the data that you need here to also take a look at what does this vulnerability encompass, um, what are the attack vectors, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, you know, we have the links to official resources there as well. So if you come across a random vulnerability, even if it's not in your environment, you can see here that on the assets it says zero, so it's not in our environment. That's also why we couldn't find it earlier in the search box, but you're still able to get all the information that you might want to have. So just take a look at what is this vulnerability specifically um, and, and how serious is it according to the official resources. That being said, um, if you have your big list of vulnerabilities that you wanna go through, um, as you can see here in my demo environment, I have about eight and a half thousand of them. Way too many to really get started on anything, well, to really start narrowing down or go through them one by one. It's way too much. Um, but there are a few tools that you can use. First of all, and this is relatively new, is that we have the multiple sorting now. So by default, you'll see that it's sorted on risk score, but you can sort on any of the columns that are in here. Um, so if you want to sort on something else, you simply click on the other column that you wanna sort on and you'll see numbers appearing. This will give you an indication of what the sort order is, um, as well as the arrows that shows whether it's ascending or descending sorting. Um, and if you wanna remove any of them, you can. So if, for example, I'm more interested in just the highest volume, um, finding the vulnerability that's present on the most number of assets in my environment, I can just remove the one on risk score um, after I've added the one on assets. And now I've sorted in a way where I see the vulnerabilities at the top with that has been detected on the most amount of assets. And you can do that for anything and you can combine it as well. So if I just want the number of assets as my top priority, um, but obviously risk score is also a, um, an important factor then I'll add that as a second one. Um, maybe the severity that has been given, although that's a high, high likelihood that that's very similar to the risk score. So maybe attack factor is a better one to take as a third one. Um, and we can even do attack complexity as a fourth one. Um, it is currently limited to four, so you can choose up to four columns that you wanna sort however you want to sort them. 
Um, and that way you can kind of narrow down or make the list a bit a little bit more usable for your specific use case. Um, I know that it's not, we don't really have a template or a suggested method of which column suits you sort on which way. Um, different people have different preferences on, on what they find the most important. Um, personally, my preference goes out to uh, taking a look at attack, attack complexity first, um, simply because if it, the complexity to you know, exploit the vulnerability is very low, um, then that obviously, regardless of on how many assets is, it's on, if it is on one of the assets in your environment and it's easy to exploit, then you probably want to take it as a priority, even if it's a lower vulnerability or a lower, um, it has a lower score. Um, again, you can then do a second one on score if that's kind of your second most important factor. And then you can already see that here at the top, for example, we have a couple or quite a few ones that are low complexity, um, but have a high score, high risk score. Um, and then as a third one, you can even add assets so that um, you kind of get that better mix of um, taking a look at how how easy is something to exploit in combination with how prevalent or how, uh, how, how many devices in our environment have this vulnerability active. Um, now, there are a few extra things here as well. Um, customizable views has been touched on in a couple of our previous videos as well, um, but it plays a big role here because there's a few columns here that you can add that are interesting to add. Um, so, for example, the privilege required one is an interesting one to add. Obviously, also one of the metrics that you can use to take a look at how easy it is to exploit a vulnerability. If there are no privileges required for the attacker, um, then it's obviously very easy for them to also uh, abuse it. There's a few other things here as well um, that you can add if you're interested in, but I think really the, um, the privilege required one is one of the, the most important ones that isn't added by default. Um, so you can apply that. Once you have your view kind of set up the way you want, you can add even additional things or start narrowing it down because now we still have, well, we have a more relevant list because it's sorted better. It's still a list of eight and a half thousand vulnerabilities. Um, now, if we want to narrow that down, we can go to the filters. By default, you'll always see that in the filters, uh, we have the confidence equals to high uh, filters added there by default. That's obviously because we want to ensure that you only see vulnerabilities um, that we are sure of, that we have a high confidence in, that we have detected in your environment. You can remove that if you're interested in just seeing whatever, like everything that we found, but that we might not be super confident about that's actually present in your environment. But I would recommend leaving it there um, just to reduce the number of false positives that you'll see. Now, if you want to narrow it down even more, all of the columns that you've added, you can also filter on. Um, a good one to do that on would be, for example, the base score, um, or actually, I think it's called risk score is the one that's the main number. Yes, risk score. So if you just really want to narrow it down to the most critical ones, and let's say, for example, that your risk score is your primary thing that you want to look at or your primary uh, criteria, you can always say, you know, risk score has to be um, greater or equal to, and then we'll just take a high number like nine. So if it's greater or equal to the nine, that will show up. And this is how you can really narrow your list down. So we've gone from eight and a half thousand to still 500 and almost 50 results, but it is a much smaller number and something that's much more manageable to go through, especially once you've sorted it already correctly. It means that the most important things for you will already be at the top. Um, so the further you go down, the um, less impactful the things theoretically should be for you. Um, once you've done all of this, uh, obviously you don't want to repeat this every time that you come back to this specific view. So um, at the top you'll see there's an unsaved view. You can click, uh, click on that and you can save this view as well to one of your custom views. Um, risk score test, I'll quickly do that there. Save it. And then in your custom views, you'll see that it will be added uh, amongst any of the other custom views that are already done. Um, as comes or as is the same with any uh, custom view that you have, you can rename them, you can obviously edit them as you want, but you can also importantly share them with uh, anyone that's in or that's a part of your Landsweeper site. So if you want to share them with other people within your organization, you can easily do so. Um, and if you want to segment it up a bit more, similar to what I've done, I've created one for a CVSS score higher than nine, one that's uh, between seven and nine, 
and then one that's lower than seven. That way you can kind of work in buckets. If you have, you know, if you have a larger team that has multiple people in a cybersecurity team, then you can also, you know, create different buckets for different people, um, even depending on, uh, you know, what kind of area they're um, focused on. Um, and kind of tackle it more easily that way. But there's many different ways that you can really tackle these vulnerabilities if you use the custom views well and use those multiple filters as well in an organized manner. Last but not least, another important thing is also being able to ignore vulnerabilities. So if you are on the main vulnerability page um, or any really view that you have of vulnerabilities, you can, as you can see, select vulnerabilities, or you can select multiple of them. Um, and there is a way here at the top right to ignore them. Um, this is used for when vulnerabilities are, you know, it can happen that there are false positives, that way you can hide them. It might be that you choose to not fix them if they're too low or um, the vulnerability has a specific condition to which your machines do not actually match. For example, they need to have a specific service installed um, or they require a user to interact with a you know, malicious email or something like that. Um, and you choose that you know, instead of trying to fix this on the device level, you're going to fix this by ensuring that your users are trained or whatever you do. Um, whatever the method or the reason might be, if you want to hide certain vulnerabilities or mark them as, I guess, as completed, even though you haven't fixed them, um, you can select them, you can hide them or ignore them as they're called. You can even identify why you're not actually um, or why you're hiding them or ignoring them. And once you've confirmed them, they'll be moved to the other tab here where you have a list of your ignored vulnerabilities. As always, if you later change your mind or you come to a point where you do want to um, fix them, you can always reselect them um, and then hide or unhide them so that they can be viewed again by everyone. Another thing that's relatively new to the vulnerabilities is that if you are interested in integrating, um, with or using integrating Land Super with any other product, um, then we also now allow you to uh, display or you know, uh, expose the vulnerability data through our API. Um, now, if you go to your profile to developer tools, then you'll see here there's a link to documentation. Um, this is where you'll find all the documentation about the API. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out more about the API and what is there, then you can easily do it here. This also shows you or has examples of it, um, as well as uh, a lot of other things that you can find here about the API, how to create a request, um, for example, is all shown here, as well as an overview of all of the fields as well. Um, there's one here specifically for vulnerabilities um, that gives you examples on vulnerabilities on how you can request them and add them to other products that you want to add this vulnerability data to. For example, if you're using an IT service management tool, um, you might already have an integration with Landsuper where you're pulling in assets so that when you have a ticket, um, it also shows the asset that is related to that ticket. Now, theoretically, you could also add the vulnerabilities that are vulnerable or that are active on that machine so that your service technician or your service desk, help desk person, whatever they're called, um, they can now, aside from also seeing what device is related to the ticket, they can also immediately see what the vulnerabilities were active on that, on that specific machine. Um, so there's a lot more options there as well. And uh, with that being said, I think I've covered most of the thing or all, well, the important things at least for kind of taking a look at your vulnerabilities, ensuring that you know which ones are the most critical, um, how you can make sure that you sort them in a way that is usable for you and that you're not stuck with a massive list of thousands and thousands of vulnerability so it becomes actually usable for you and that you can prioritize the vulnerabilities that you're interested in. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.